Hey, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Story Church. Glad y'all are here. How are we doing today? Scale of 1 to 10? Shout it out. Oh, all right. Got a lot of 10s in the room. All right. Okay. So anybody run the marathon last week? A few of you? Hey, all right. Congrats. Congrats. Way to go. I did not. I was preaching. If I had not been preaching, I would have run the marathon. Uh, <laughs> why are y'all laughing? Um, uh, <laughs> if you tried to get here last week and missed the memo about us not um, being able to open our, our building here last week, I'm sorry. We were in Timber Grove only, at least in person. We were and always are in, uh, online. And if you're joining us online uh, today, you're part of our church. Wherever you are in the world, we're thankful that you're part of our uh, online campus today. All right. Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm always glad you're here on Sundays because I always feel like when we talk about important stuff, that's always a goal is to like not just talk about religious stuff that doesn't apply to anyone's lives. We always want to talk about topics that hit you in the heart and, and in real life, you know, kind of topics. And so I think that's always the case. Um, but rarely do we get to come together and um, talk about what I think might be the most important thing, like thematically or topically. I think this might be the most important topic that we could ever talk about. And I mean that. I mean that if you're ready to absorb today's message for all of its faults and flaws and its flawed messenger and all that mixed in, like, like if you are ready to hear what God has for you today, I think it really could be a game changer in your everyday life starting now. I think it's that big of a deal that we talk about today's um, topic. And so the, the topic that we're digging into today is forgiveness. We're going to talk about forgiveness and what it means to be forgiven, what it means to forgive. I think we have a lot of misunderstandings about what forgiveness is, what it isn't, and I think those misunderstandings keep us from receiving forgiveness and keep us from being more forgiving toward others in our lives. And so um, you have study guides, and uh, hopefully those study guides will be helpful to you as we um, get ready to get into today's um, message Let's get right to it then. I've got, uh, I've got a lot to say today, so no more mincing words. This is part eight of 22 in our series called A Physician and the Facts. This is a 22-week journey through the Gospel of Luke, and this is going to take us through Easter, through the week after Easter, actually. I'm really enjoying this. We've never had a 22-week series before. Usually it's like five, six, seven weeks maybe because we're always like, people's attention spans are so short. And so we're asking you to really dial in with us and go 22 weeks through the Gospel of Luke. And I've really enjoyed it so far. Today, though, Luke's going to hit us between the eyes um, with a topic we all need to hear about, this topic of forgiveness. All right, so we're going to start by looking at Luke chapter 5, verse 17. And I'm just going to read three verses, 17, 18, and 19. And if you have a Bible with you or your Bible in the chair back in front of you, you can grab that or Bible app. Um, open that. I always encourage you to get familiar with your own Bible in some way or another and not just read it off a page that's given to you or whatever, but like, uh, that's cool if that's where you're at today. Just know I'd love for you to bring your Bible with you to church. This is Luke 5, verse 17. It says, one day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law, those are uh, the hyper-religious guys, you know, this, you know these guys, right? They were sitting there and they'd come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. So word's getting out about Jesus. He's starting to make some waves. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house and to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. I'm going to pause there before we read the rest of the passage, just because we need to honor these four guys. <laughs> like, it should be everyone's goal to find yourself in a community of guys like this. Like, these guys who will stop at nothing to help their friend, and specifically to get their friend to Jesus. Like, this is the kind of friends that you want in your life, right? So, and if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the kind of friend you should be becoming for your friends, for your loved ones, this kind of passionate, mission-focused, nothing standing in my way. When I, when I see these guys, I think about the men of the story who I've seen galvanize around a mission and let nothing stand in their way from accomplishing that mission. There's really nothing more exciting than seeing that because men are usually so stoic about uh, 
our faith, our religion, right? We're always so like stone-faced and we hardly ever sing in church, except lately I've started to hear men sing more at the story. And I heard one of my mentors say one time, there's two sounds in a church that tell you that the Holy Spirit's there, men singing and babies crying. And we had always had the second, Um, we lacked the first and more and more I'm hearing men sing and that's a good sign because it means men are waking up And when men wake up to a mission, and especially when it's a team thing, like they're on mission with a team of other men, there's nothing that stands in their way. These men galvanized around their buddy who was paralyzed, laying on a mat. Not only did they carry him on his mat all the way to Jesus, to this house where the healer was, when they couldn't get inside through orthodox means because of the crowd, they somehow developed a human pulley system and pulled their buddy up on his mat onto the roof of this house They vandalized someone's home by tearing a hole in the roof, like they had to dig through the thatch and the mud to get through a a hole big enough to get their friend through, right? So pretty good-sized hole in some stranger's house in the roof, and and then they, they got him to Jesus. It's a beautiful story, and it's really a testimony about the power of faithful friends. And if you're a faithful friend, you need to know that your faith can open your friend up to the intercession of God or to the, the, the will and act of God. Like what we're about to see, the faithfulness of the friends is what got the man what he really needed most. Okay, so let's read verse 20 and see what I'm talking about. Luke five twenty says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. It doesn't say when Jesus saw how good a guy he is, when Jesus saw he's really trying, when Jesus saw his religion. It says when Jesus saw his friend's faith. And that's a whole different message. I'm not here to preach that message, but it is a message that all of us should know about, at least vaguely. It's the power of your faith and what it can do in the lives of others, okay, through you. It's powerful. Now, that aside, we have to be real with each other and recognize the obvious, which is that when Jesus forgave this man's sins, it must have been the most anticlimactic moment. (laughs) If you really put put yourself in that house or in the shoes or sandals of one of those four friends that helped get this guy to Jesus through these extraordinary means, Like, imagine how deflating it would have been to have your friend's broken body laying on a mat, to have the healer look at him and say, your sins are forgiven. Like, I imagine you could have heard a pin drop in that room. I imagine the four buddies going like, okay, and? (laughs) Like, what else you got? Because we didn't just commit a felony, breaking and entering or whatever, to get his sins forgiven. He doesn't need more religion. What he needs is healing. What he needs most is for his legs to work. And here you are forgiving his sins. Uh, so I imagine it would have been a little bit of a letdown. They, they came for something they thought was bigger and more important than just forgiveness. They were wrong about that. I'm gonna talk about why they're wrong, but still it's something all of us would have probably felt the same way about. Let's keep going. Luke 5, um, now we'll finish the passage, 21 to 26, and we'll talk about it. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So all this praising rejoicing, we've seen remarkable things today. None of that happened when Jesus forgave his sins. But it all happened after Jesus healed his body, which is to sort of uh, suggest, in no uncertain terms, that we humans believe that what matters more when you consider the soul and the body, what matters more is the body. What matters more is physical healing. That matters way more than forgiveness of sins. Jesus is trying to show that the opposite is true. 
that it's actually the case that, you know, healing, as important as it is, as big a deal as it can be to the one that's healed, to forgive their sins is more important. It's a bigger deal. He would even say that it's harder to forgive someone's sins. And that's why he prioritized forgiving the man's sins. Now, that's also why the Pharisees and teachers of the law call them a, a blasphemer, which is the worst thing that a rabbi can be called. Because the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures make it clear only God can forgive sins. Only God can do that. And so when Jesus forgives this man's sins, he's saying two very important things. He's laying down two facts that we need to know. First, he's laying down the most important fact about himself, which is that he's not just a teacher. He's not just a religious guru or a leader or a really nice guy or even just a healer. Jesus is saying in no uncertain terms, he's God in the flesh because only God can forgive sins. Everybody knew that in the Hebrew world. And so he's forgiving sins. He's saying, I'm God. If you've got friends that say Jesus never said he was God, and so why are you a Christian, that kind of thing, you need to know that this is just one of many instances which Jesus comes out of the closet as God in the flesh. Like plainly, he says he's God. And after he identifies this most important thing about himself, he identifies maybe the most important thing about us, maybe the most important thing about our condition here. By forgiving this man's sins before healing his body, Jesus is, is indicating to us that our greatest single need, the thing we need most, is forgiveness. And I want to say the same thing to you today, because this is something that took me a long time to learn, but something that's changed my life. What you need from God more than anything, more urgently, what you should be praying about more passionately is the forgiveness of your sins. And so often we ask God for everything but that. We ask God for physical things. We ask God for, you know, uh, soulmates or a healthy marriage or healthy kids, or we ask God for a better job or more money or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with asking God for those kinds of things. He does care about our physical needs. He cares about our bodies. Jesus did do some healings and work wonders, but he didn't heal everyone's body. He left more broken bodies unhealed than those he healed. But when it comes to forgiveness of sins, he forgave Everyone sins. Every sin was forgiven by Jesus. That's because that's what he came to do. Luke's uh, gospel later in, in, in Luke chapter uh, 19, Jesus says, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So to save the lost literally means to, to save a sinner the only way to save a sinner is by forgiveness. And Jesus is saying, my number one thing, my first priority, first things first, what I came to do is to forgive sinners of their sins. Now, this doesn't mean that the church shouldn't be healing. We should. It doesn't mean we, it shouldn't be part of our mission. But we need to make first things first. And the first thing you and me and the whole world needs to know is that Jesus came to deal with our sin. And it's not bad news to put our sins in front of us and deal with it. It's the best news. It's the best possible thing for us. Jesus could have healed that man's body without forgiving his sin, and nothing would have changed for him in the grand, grand scheme of things. But by forgiving his sin first, Jesus changed his whole trajectory. He can do the same for us. Max Lucado, great Christian preacher and author, put it this way. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, he would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent an enter entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. And if you're thinking this sounds just like old-time religion, like in a bad way, if you're thinking this sounds a little Baptist or something, like it reminds you of some judgmental church you grew up in, I just want you to stay open to this because it's not about making you feel bad about yourself. It's not about making you ashamed or keeping you down. You know, sin's not even a religious word at the end of the day. It's a word we all agree on. Religious and non-religious people agree in, uh, on sin, and what it means is the, miss, the missing of a target. You should be hitting this target, but you're doing this instead. 
And whether you're a secular person who believes in social justice and, and how we're missing the mark on social justice, or whether you're a Christian and you believe that we should be striving for the holiness of God and we're missing the mark in all these ways, whatever the case is with you, you believe in sin. And the Christian point of view about sin is that the only way to atone for that sin is to trust God and what he's done for us through Christ Jesus. The world will tell you that, uh, you know, the only way to atone for your sin is to do better. As I said a couple weeks ago, the only way to atone for your sin is to atone for yourself. And that I have found to be a path to hell on earth. And that is what has led us to this cancel culture. All right? So when we talk about sin and forgiveness, this is all we're talking about. And to be clear before I go on, because I know there's some of you that are tripping over some stumbling blocks in the path, I want to clear the path a little bit by telling you what forgiveness is not. Because knowing what forgiveness isn't is almost as important as knowing what it is, because there have been some misunderstandings. Some of you have been told that to forgive is to forget. Forgive and forget, they told you. They even told you that at church, and I don't know why they did it. Because to forget someone's sins is to not hold them accountable. It's to be a fool. It's to keep walking into the same trap and the same problem over and over again, to never expect anything to change, to never hold anyone to account. You don't want those who love you to forget your sins. You want them to forget like the debt or that you owe them anything for those sins. You don't want them to forget your sins because no one could hold you accountable. To forgive is not to forget. The second thing I want you to know is that to forgive is not to excuse bad behavior. This kind of goes hand in hand with the first. And, and it's actually the opposite of just excusing bad behavior. I, I hear a lot of rhetoric in the world today, especially in that cancel culture kind of world view that says, well, this, this emphasis on Judeo-Christian values and forgiveness, for example, it puts the onus on the victim to excuse their assailant or their wrongdoer, the one who sinned against them, right? And we have to stop doing that. We have to stop expecting victims to forgive, and that just perpetuates the problems. And, and yet I don't see this new secular solution to sin doing any good. I don't see us getting anywhere as a society in terms of, you know, growing closer together and bridging the divide between us. Seems like it's actually doing more harm to just keep canceling each other across various aisles and politics and things like that. And, and to forgive was, was never really to excuse bad behavior. In fact, it's the opposite of that. The beginning of forgiveness is naming bad behavior. It's actually shining a light on what happened and what it did to you, how it hurt you, and, and being honest about that. The third thing that forgiveness is not is that forgiveness is not a feeling. If you wait until you feel like it to forgive someone, you'll probably never get around to it because just like real love is not a feeling but a choice, forgiveness is not a feeling but it is a choice that you're free to make. Fourth, um, forgiveness is not always reconciling. This is a big stumbling block for some of y'all. Some of you have said things like, I will never forgive him for what he did to me. And you say that in part, I think, because, not to put words in your mouth, but I think people say that because you think that to forgive them would mean to go back to them and just have a relationship with them like you did before and sweep it all under the rug and act like everything's cool. That's not it. I mean, obviously we hope for reconciliation. We hope that forgiveness opens the door to reconciliation. But if the person you have to forgive is not open to your forgiveness, you still can forgive them. And by forgiving someone who's not playing along or not willing to receive your forgiveness, you are at least releasing yourself from this indentured servitude you've been working under, you know, by, by what they did to you. you. You're letting go of that animosity. You're letting go of that debt that they owed you. You're just absorbing it and moving on, whether they're coming along for the ride or not. Sometimes forgiveness can mean walking away. Don't let the supposed conflation between forgiveness and, and, and reconciliation keep you from forgiving. And fifth and finally, forgiveness is not uh, free, nor is it cheap, nor is it easy. It's costly, and it hurts, and it's always going to hurt to forgive because to forgive is not just simply, you know, being a good person. To forgive is literally to absorb a debt that someone owes you. They owe you damages, and that's real. 
and it's a real debt that they owe you and, and, and that sin that they committed against you created imbalance in your relationship and you feel in your bones that there should be justice and that balance needs to be rectified and, and you think maybe that what that looks like is them groveling and begging and atoning for their sins. What it really looks like is you forgiving them and what they owe you, absorbing the debt yourself. And, and debt doesn't just evaporate when it's forgiven on you know, no matter what you've been told in the news about like student loan forgiveness and stuff, like even if the student loans are forgiven, somebody's gonna pay for them, right? Like it doesn't just evaporate into the cosmos. Like someone pays the debt. And to forgive is for you to pay the debt someone else owes you. How do we do that? How do we ever get there? That should be the question on every heart and mind this morning. Because if this is the key to our future in our relationships, how does this work? Simon Peter asked Jesus a very similar question about forgiveness. Like, how does forgiveness work? How many times do we have to forgive the same people? And Jesus, in response, told him a story. As Jesus is prone to do, we like telling stories here. We like the stories of Jesus. That's one of the reasons our church is called The Story. And in Matthew 18, he told this story about a king who had servants who owed the king money. And that's usually why servants existed is because they were debt servants and they were working off a of debt. There was one servant in particular who owed the, his, his master, the king, just an ungodly amount of money. Jesus said there was a servant who owed the king 10,000 bags of gold, which is a very vague and kind of funny like amount. 10,000 bags of gold is an unthinkable debt. Like it's un, insurmountable. One scholar that I read said that that would probably equate to something like $400 billion today. So there was a servant who owed his master $400 billion. And the master decided it was time to call his servants on their debts. And so he called this one in and said, pay up, it's time. And this servant said, I don't have the money. And so the master said, well, let's have this man and his wife and his children, their whole family, sold into, don't worry about that pen, sold into, into slavery as a way of paying off parts of, of their debt to me. And then that triggered this response in the servant. He got on his knees and he begged and he groveled and he said a lie. Something, he said just the most ridiculous lie. He said, I can pay you back, I swear. I just need more time to find $400 billion. I just need more time. And then Jesus offers the twist in the story. This is Matthew 18, verse 27. The servant's master, that's the king, took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Again, that debt didn't evaporate into the universe. He had to write that off of his own books. That came out of his treasury. $400 billion, 10,000 bags of gold, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. That's like three or four months wages. That's a debt that's payable with time. He grabbed the guy by the throat and choked him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. That's probably not a lie. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison, debtor's prison, until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours, 10,000 bags of gold. I canceled it because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Okay, so what's going on here? So far, we've established that forgiveness is the most important thing that God can offer us in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is our most pressing need. We've also established that forgiveness is very hard. And so how do we do it? With this story, Jesus illustrates that there is a direct relationship between our understanding of God's forgiveness of us and our choice to forgive others that have wronged us. 
There is a correlation that most of us ignore because we think that to be a forgiving person just means mustering the kindness from within and becoming a nicer person and forgiving. That's not it. And if you're struggling to forgive, I think that might be why. It's because of that mentality. And I'm gonna offer three quick things to think about as we uh, try to land this plane, as we think about this very important topic. The first step toward forgiveness is almost always without fail acknowledging the gravity of your own sin. Acknowledging the gravity of your own sin comes first. Before you forgive other people's sins, acknowledging your own gravity, your own sin first uh, is most important. Now, this means to understand that from heaven's point of view, what you owe, your debt to God, based on all those shoulds and oughts, the targets that you aimed at and missed, is an insurmountable debt. Every day I've sinned against God. Every day I've fallen short of that target. And so what is the debt I've racked up over time? How bad is that debt gonna look? How insurmountable? You know, this isn't, this isn't easy work, but it's essential. It's not easy because it's unpleasant to think about. None of us wanna think how bad we've been. We live in this like, self-esteem culture where we're told to think about how good we've been, right? And, and, and when the world hears you say, I'm a sinner, you know, uh, what a wretch I am, or whatever kinds of things Christians have said about our sins. The world will tell you two lies simultaneously that are self-refuting. But we usually buy both of these lies. The world will tell us, hey, nobody's perfect, so go easy on yourself, bud. We'll say, okay, that's right. Nobody's perfect, so I should go easy on myself. And the world will also tell us, hey, you're perfect just the way you are. Go easy on yourself. And we're like, that's true too. I like that. Like, yeah, either way, I'm going easy on myself, right? <clears throat> and it, it's, it's so tempting and tantalizing because it feels good to live that way. Like none of us want to just beat ourselves up with guilt and shame. We've been told that shame is bad for us. And it can be, but it can also be the beginning of something beautiful when we face our sin in the mirror for all of its gravity and see ourselves for who we really are. Man, I ran from this for years. I avoided that encounter in the mirror for years. When I was 23, Gio and I lived in Kansas City. And uh, we had been married uh, three years by that time. We got married at 20, and we were in Kansas City. We were in seminary together. Many of you know I had already fallen out of my faith by that time. I was not a believer in the supernatural claims of Christianity. I was just a social justice warrior, sort of disguised as a Christian pastor guy. And I was appointed with Gio to serve this small congregation in Kansas City. And, um, you know, we were young. We were doing the best we could, but... This congregation had needs we didn't really know how to meet. There was one woman in particular named Diane, and uh, she had a boyfriend named Steve, but Diane had all kinds of problems, um, psychological and, uh, and emotional and, and even spiritual problems, I think. And uh, she would show up once in a while at the church, and, and usually she was a mess. She was in tears, just kind of erratic behavior, and we did our best to like help her and stuff, but you know, it just really meant spending time with her and, and praying with her and just encouraging her, but you know, by the time we became her pastor, she had already been in and out of several institutions and things like that. And uh, it really sort of, uh, what triggered all of this was the death, the sudden death of her first husband 10 years before that in a motorcycle accident. And ever since then, she'd just been a wreck. Understandably so, right? So one night, about midnight, uh, Gio and I were up very late um, studying for finals the next morning. And uh, about midnight, the phone rang as we were studying for those finals and it was Steve, <clears throat> Diane's boyfriend. Maybe they were fiancés, I think, at that point. But Steve was frantic. And he says, I haven't seen Diane in about an hour or maybe more. Uh, she stormed out of the house after a fight that we had. And uh, she said she was going to go take her own life. She was going to kill herself. And I said, Steve, do you know where she went? And he said, I'm, I'm sure she went to the cemetery. Every time she talks about killing herself, she, goes to the, she says she, she's going to do it at the cemetery at the gravesite of her first husband. And uh, I said, have you thought about going to see if she's there, you know, to do something about it? And, and uh, it's been an hour, he said. He said, uh, no, I'm afraid to go because I'll trigger her. She sees me. We've been fighting. She might do something, you know, bad. Will you go, Pastor Eric, to the old cemetery um, and check and see if she's there? And, y'all, I looked at the clock, and I looked at my wife, and I looked at the stack of books and the stack of notes that I had yet to go over for the final the next morning because I'm a procrastinator, and that's one of... 
One of many sins in my story, right? Always has been. And I told Steve, listen, um, I'm gonna call the, the police and have them send a squad car to the cemetery to see if she's there. And you, if, if she doesn't come home within an hour, you call me back. I'm sure she's fine. This is, you know, not the first time she's done this. And she gets home within an hour, or she's not home within an hour, you call me back and, and uh, I'll go down there to the cemetery to find her. And to say that I regret that conversation is, would be the understatement of my life. Because the should or the ought in that moment, I knew is that I should have gone to that cemetery right away. I should have. Like, there's no question. You can't talk me out of that now. Like, I let some people talk me out of it for a while. They're like, you're young. She had threatened before, and she never followed through on it. Or, you know, um, you probably wouldn't have even stopped her anyway. An hour later, Steve called and said that... uh, the police had found Diane's body and she had taken her own life right there at the cemetery. And uh, immediately I felt guilty. And I can't tell you that that guilt was misplaced because I probably could have saved a life that night. And coming to grips with that, how I missed the mark that night, took years. And what do you think I did with all that shame and self-loathing? You think I dealt with it in a healthy way? You think I took it to the word of God that I didn't believe in at that time? You think I took it to a trusted group of Bible-believing Christian men who could hold me to account and hold me up when I was collapsing in shame? You think, no, I didn't have that. And I didn't trust the Bible because seminary talked me out of it, (laughs) ironically enough. And, uh, And so what I did with it is I continued what I'd been working on for much of my adult life thus far is that I just stored it away someplace deep inside of me. I shoved that shame into some drawer in my soul where you shove the bills you can't pay or don't want to look at. And I left it there thinking, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. It doesn't exist. And over time... I became an expert at doing just that. I did not understand what some of y'all, I would imagine, probably don't uh, know yet, but I hope everyone leaves here knowing. What I did not know then is that not dealing with sin and shame will only open you up to more sin and more shame. And it is a universal truth that people who are secretly ashamed are more likely to do shameful things in secret. And so to call someone you love out on their sin and to deal with your own sin or be called out on your sin, it's not an act of hate. It's not a hate crime. It's not a microaggression or anything else that they want to say it is in this world. What it is is an act of love. It's the greatest act of love. Because anything short of that, absent accountability and dealing with sin and shame leads you down this path of developing an expertise in hiding sins. And I became not only good at hiding my sins, I became good at hiding my remorse for what I'd done. And it wasn't just about Diane, you know, that was just one thing. It was about other sins that I became an expert at hiding, sins of anger and sins of lust and, you know, sins of of hatred toward conservative Christians who tried to tell me I was a sinner, sins of, you know, unspeakable slander of other people, short-tempered sins against my wife. The longer my list of sins grew, the less I wanted to talk about my sin, and the less I talked about my sin, the easier it became for me to keep sinning because I'd already broken that barrier. Who cares now, you know? It's profound and insidious, the games the enemy can play with us. And I lost sight of the fact that I was indeed a sinner in need of a savior because I wasn't dealing with my own sin and shame. And maybe you're not either. Maybe that's why you struggle to extend forgiveness to others. With that in mind, let's go to step two. Step one is looking in the mirror and seeing your sin. Step two 
is accepting the grace of God. It occurred to me uh, earlier this morning that um, this week is my 10-year anniversary of the trip to the Holy Land in 2013. When I uh, saw Jesus for who he really is, I realized for the first time in my life, even though I'm a preacher's kid, I'd been in church my whole life, I never realized that when Christians say Jesus died for your sins, that it meant me and my sins. I just thought it meant those bad people somewhere else, those non-Christian people living in other parts of the world or those people that are drunk or high or, you know, whatever, having sex outside of marriage. Like, those sinners is who Jesus died for. And for the first time in Capernaum 10 years ago this week, I realized that he came and lived and died for me. And when he went to the cross, he did so for every sin and every sinner, the Bible puts it uh, this way in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And I realized on the shoreline of Capernaum, for the first time in my life, this wrecked me and destroyed me in the most beautiful way possible, that Jesus died for what I did that night on the phone with Steve and Diane. And what I didn't do. And Jesus died for me, and every time I gotten angry and acted out against people or dropped F-bombs in traffic or, <laughs> or he died for everything I left undone. He died for every porn site I ever visited. He died for all of that and all that baggage and, and stuff. I want to say a bad word there. Like all that stuff I'd been carrying around for years was already forgiven. It was a debt that had been forgiven that I insisted on carrying around with me. And if you've ever felt overburdened or condemned by your sin, it's not because Jesus hasn't forgiven you yet. It's because you have yet to receive it. You've yet to let him take it. The debt's already been paid and you're carrying that drawer full of unpaid bills around like, like it's not for you. His forgiveness is for you. And when you acknowledge your sin that stares you in the mirror, you can then accept the grace of God extended to you in Jesus. And then, only after steps one and two do we get to step three, where we become more forgiving people. Step three is forgive others as God has forgiven you. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Jesus said, when we pray, to pray, Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us, right? It's in that order. And if you're out there trying to be a more forgiving person to your loved ones, your friends, coworkers, whatever, but you haven't received the forgiveness from God, you will not have the capacity or the resources within you to absorb the debts that other people owe you. And if you find it impossible to forgive, or if you ever get to the point where you say, I'll never forgive so-and-so for what they've done to me, go back to step one and repeat as necessary. Look in the mirror and see your sin for what it is or what it was, what it has been, what it will be, and understand that when Jesus died on the cross, he took your sin with him and he left it there in the grave. And everything you've done or ever will do that was falls short of his perfect will it's already been forgiven. The debt's already been paid. And you, your, your resources, if you want to look at it that way, then are freed up. The strength you've been using to carry around your own debt is suddenly freed up to take on the debts that others owe you. So if you've struggled to forgive your spouse and your marriage is on the rocks today due to unforgiveness about something they've done, or if you've struggled to forgive a parent who did something to you, maybe recently, maybe long ago, or if you've struggled to forgive a child or a friend, a pastor, someone who've hurt you in the past, like if you've struggled to forgive, ask yourself, have I received God's forgiveness? Am I free from my own debt? And if not, give it to Jesus. Absorb his forgiveness for you. And ask him, after that, ask him to show you how to forgive those around you. This is what I mean when I say that forgiveness can be a game changer in our real lives starting now. Without forgiveness, the truth is all of us might as well be paralyzed, helpless on a mat. Without the forgiveness of Jesus, we're all slaves to our own debt. But Jesus came to cancel every debt and set every soul free. I pray you'll receive it today 
by confessing your sin, receiving his grace, and extending his forgiveness to those around you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the miracle of forgiveness. It's truly the greatest miracle we'll ever know. We've asked for various other kinds of miracles, Lord, and we think we need those miracles more than forgiveness, Lord, but you came to show us that the single most miraculous act ever done on this earth happened at the cross when every sin committed by every person everywhere was forgiven. Every debt was paid. And so we celebrate and rejoice in that grace that's afforded to us, Lord. We receive it now. As we confront our own sin, we receive your forgiveness and we accept your challenge, Holy Spirit, to go and forgive as we have been forgiven by God. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.